The presentation title today is What Are You Beholding? The ostrich is a very big bird. In fact, it's the biggest bird in the world. It stands at 2.7 meters tall and it weighs up to 159 kilograms. The ostrich can run extraordinarily fast. It can run at speeds of over 70 kilometers an hour. However, the ostrich's brain is very small. In fact, it's smaller than its eyeball. For this reason, when the ostrich feels threatened, like, let's say, its life is in danger, there's a lion coming around, do you know what the ostrich does? The ostrich will run away as fast as it can, which is about 70 kilometers an hour. The idea that the ostrich buries its head in the sand is a myth. There was a group of scientists who studied 100,000 ostriches and never once did they see one bury their head in the sand. I don't know what kind of scientists do this research. But what they actually do is they lay their eggs and they sometimes will roll their eggs using their head and this gave, gives the impression that their head is in the sand. But they've never been known to actually bury their head in the sand. When Threatened, they will run away as fast as possible. Bananas. Vomit. Something very interesting happened in your brains when you heard these words. In fact, I even saw an expression on a number of your faces that was, was an expression of disgust. You see, when you hear these words, and for the next few minutes you're going to have a slight aversion to bananas because these two words were presented together. Don't worry, it'll pass in about two minutes. Now, your brain, when it hears a word like vomit, it will respond by activating the center of the brain that remembers and that memories associated with this word are stored. And as such, the things that we hear the things that we see, we actually experience them. There's a group led by John Barge at New York University who did a very interesting experiment. They got people to make sentences of four words out of five words. For example, they were given words such as finds he it yellow instantly. And they were asked to make four word sentences. One could be he finds it instantly or he finds yellow instantly. This was the control group. The group that they were actually interested, they were given five words, one of which had a theme pertaining to the elderly. These words included things like grey, forgetful, bald, Florida, wrinkle. Don't blame me, I didn't make this experiment. And what they did is they then asked the people to take the responses, the four-word sentence that they wrote, down the hall to where someone would look at the answers they gave. What the people that were being tested didn't realize is that the experiment happened in the hall. They looked at the time that it took people to walk down the hall. And what they found was that people that had words that they were using that were vaguely pertaining to the elderly took significantly longer to walk down the hall. This is termed the Florida effect. Now I want you to think about that for one second. Simply seeing and writing a word that vaguely pertains to the elderly can affect you, can make you walk slower without you realizing it and without your consent. Another group in England did an experiment looking at a honesty box. Now, these, um, we used to have one of these in the physiology department at Monash University when I was studying there. And essentially what it is, it's a box and next to it is some chips and candy and other things that you may want to eat. And since it was run by students, if you were to get the items from there, they were 
much cheaper than from the shops or the canteen. So essentially you would take a packet of chips and you'd put however much the packet of chips cost. So what these people did, they decided to put an image above the honesty box. One week they would put images of flowers. The next week they would put an image of eyes. And they did this for a period of 10 weeks. These were the images that were used and they found that in the weeks where eyes were present, people put three times as much money in the honesty box as in the weeks that the eyes weren't present. Think about this. A image can make you give more money without your consent and without you realizing it. No one commented that they even noticed these images. We experience the things that we see and hear. Because when someone saw those eyes, even though they weren't actually, wasn't actually anyone there, they saw eyes, their brain made the connection, oh, I'm being watched. And then they acted as they would act if someone was actually watching them even though they were just uh, paper eyes. Another group had a look at the influence that money has on behavior. Simply the thought of money. And what they did is they tested a number of students. The control group didn't have any money prompts, but the group that was, was actually being tested, what they did is they had two ways of prompting them to think about money. One was there was a computer in the room, and on it was a screensaver with floating dollar bills, similar to, to this one. And another one, they had a small stack of Monopoly money somewhere on the table. And what would happen, as they were apparently waiting for the experiment to happen, someone would walk in the room carrying a, a big stack of books and a little cup of pencils. 27 pencils, those ones that you use when you're playing mini golf, the little ones. And as they would walk past the test subject, they would drop the pencils and then struggle to pick them up while holding the big stack of books they were carrying. And what they found was that the people prompted with money, the people that had money on the brain, helped them pick up significantly less pencils than those who didn't. In another group they tested, they had a student in the room who was asking for help. The people who had money on the brain spent significantly less time helping than those who didn't. Another thing they did is they got them to put two chairs for an interview. And what they found was the people that were thinking about money put the seats significantly further apart than those who weren't. I think it was 70, around 70 centimeters further apart than the ones that didn't have money on the brain. Again, I want you to think about this. A random thing in the room can influence your behavior. A small stack of Monopoly bills in the corner of a table in the room can make people behave more selfishly without them realizing it and without their consent. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning researcher in the field of psychology and economy. He writes this statement, living in a culture that surrounds us with reminders of money may shape our behavior and attitudes in ways we do not know about and of which we may not be proud. It's no wonder that Jesus said it's hard for someone who's wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. What you see and hear around you can shape your behavior. It can influence you to behave in ways that you wouldn't if these things, if these things weren't around you, if you weren't seeing these things. I spent a significant part of my life watching all kinds of nonsense. I would actually probably spend an average of about 
eight, day, eight hours a day watching just rubbish shows after shows after shows, all, all kinds of things. I was filling my head with nonsense. One of the shows, and this is just an example that, that I used to watch, was a show called Vampire Diaries. The things that happened in this show, many of them were truly satanic, all kinds of ritualistic worship things, and it was full of violence and very sexualized scenes. And I used to think, oh, this is okay. It's not too bad. Even though the warning label was quite clear, strong supernatural themes and violence, I thought, nah, this doesn't affect me. There's a number of warning labels on certain things that we watch. And I used to look at these warning labels and instead of thinking, oh, hang on, this has sex scenes and drug use. This may not be suitable for Christian consumption. I used to actually use these labels to select what I was going to watch. Oh, violence and nudity. You may want to watch this one, right? The enemy has found a way to enter into our houses to make us sin without even moving. Jesus says, You've heard it said by those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you look at the warning labels on many of the things that we watch, you think, it's like, oh, this will cause this, this will cause this. But we say, ah, it's, it's not too bad. A little earlier, Jesus says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry at his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. A lot of the shows I used to watch were full of violence and revenge. In fact, there was a show I used to love to watch that was called Revenge. And I want to ask you just, just to think a little bit. If a small stack of Monopoly money can influence your behavior without you realizing it, if some eyes printed on the back of the wall can influence your behavior, if vague words pertaining to the elderly such as gray and wrinkle can modify your behavior, do you think that watching things full of violence and coarse language can potentially influence your behavior too? The question I have is, what are you beholding? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.16, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What Paul is writing here is that as we focus our eyes on God, we are being transformed. We are being transformed into that image by, by spending time with God. I've shared with a few of you how my life changed after I read this book. In fact, this book led me to the book that changed my life. It suggested that I spend time every day reading my Bible. What I didn't share with you was before, was something that happened about four months before this. In fact, it was, it's been seven years and eight days since, since this happened. It was on the 13th of August, I remember the date. I made the decision that I'm not going to allow myself to watch things from Hollywood that I know are unfit for Christian consumption. And something happened in my life because there's two things I did. One of the things I did was to try shut out the influence of the enemy in my life. And the other thing I did was focus on God. And this completely changed my life. Paul writes, whatever things is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent or praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. You see, Paul knows that when we meditate on things that are true and noble and praiseworthy, then we will be changed into the same image. Our characters will be made more noble, more pure, more lovely. Now, if we can be changed into looking more like the character of God by 
looking at godly things, do you think the opposite is also true? If we look at ungodly things, won't we also be, our characters be changed in that direction? My question again is, what are you beholding? You see, Paul gives us a list of behavior that's ungodly. In Galatians chapter 5, he writes, Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I didn't think they had Hollywood in his day. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. One of the founders of the Adventist church, Ellen White, writes, If we venture on Satan's ground, we have no assurance of protection from his power. Think about this. If you use a, a war illustration, right? Imagine that you are at war and we actually are at war with the enemy, right? If in a battle you would decide to say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to go for a walk. I'll walk into the enemy's camps. I'll walk past their snipers. I'll be fine. God will protect me. Right? What Alan White is saying here is no. If we venture onto his ground, deliberately going where we know we shouldn't go, we have no assurance of protection from his power. She continues, those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. So essentially, those who wouldn't fall prey to Satan's devices, those who would not fall victim to Satan's tricks, must guard the avenues to the soul. Now, what's the avenues to the soul? How does one reach the soul? Well, you reach the soul, that's one thief, through the eyes is one, but you can reach the mind through the senses. Right? That's why she says, we must avoid reading, seeing or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. She continues, the mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. I would have an issue with this. I've actually recently been convicted that this is something I, I need to work on because what I would find myself doing is I would find myself scrolling and scrolling and you know little things come up clickbait said oh i wonder what this is about i wonder what this is about and as soon as i would start to listen to it i would hear you know words language that was inappropriate for me to hear i would see videos of people dressed not the way that it's appropriate for me to look at and you think ah it's not too bad it, it's all right what she says here is the mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. We need to avoid the things which will suggest impure thoughts. Now, I have a, a question for you. Do you think that sex scenes provoke impure thoughts? Do you think that violence provokes impure thoughts? Do you think that coarse language provokes impure thoughts? Or nudity? How about we say, ah, it's not that bad. In John 10.10 10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. We're told here that the thief, the enemy, comes he doesn't have the purpose of entertaining us. He doesn't have the purpose of uh, making us have, have rest and have, have some peace. His purpose is very clear. His purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And for much of my life, I used to think, and, and even now occasionally I, I get trapped into thinking, ah, it's not that bad. There's something that, that I've recently become very aware of. If it's not that bad then it's at least a little bad, right? You don't say it's not that bad something that God gives you, right? God doesn't have any bad, doesn't give any bad. 
If it's not that bad, then it's at least a little bad. And if it's at least a little bad, then we know where it comes from. It comes from the enemy and it's designed to steal, kill and destroy. This is the, the a breakdown of the average hours that people spend in front of the TV. Protestants, such as ourselves, will spend on average 3.1 hours. It's interesting, I found that Christians spend more time watching TV than non-Christians. Oh, I just thought that was interesting. Now, I'm not saying that everything you watch on TV necessarily falls into these categories, but I think if we're to be honest, probably a, a good chunk of it does. How many of you here have heard of Anton LaVey? No? Anton LaVey is the founder of the Church of Satan. And he wrote an, a number of books on the, how these things should be practiced. And this is a quote directly from him. He says, There are television sets in every home, every restaurant, every hotel room, every shopping mall now. They're even small enough to carry in your pocket like electronic rosaries. It is an unquestioned part of everyday life. This was written quite a while ago. He says, kneeling before the cathode ray god with our TV guide concordance in our hand, we maintain the illusion of choice by flipping the channels, chapters and verses. It doesn't matter what is flashing on the screen. All that's important is that the TV stays on. Do you think that the founder of the Church of Satan knows that by beholding you become changed? There's another quote, he says, Many of you have read my writings indicating that the TV is the new God. There is a little thing I neglected to mention up until now. Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion. This is from the horse's mouth. What he's saying is that the major way that the enemy infiltrates into our lives today is through the television. The mind is easy to manipulate. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, ah, not my mind. Right? I used to think that. If you're thinking like that, you're even easier to manipulate because you think you can't be manipulated. Right? If a small stack of monopoly money can influence people's behavior, if eyes printed somewhere on the wall can make you give more money, then the brain can be influenced by the things that it sees. I love Gabrielle very much and she's been such a blessing in my life. Spending time with her has really changed my character. She's made me more loving, more patient, more kind. See, these things have, have just rubbed off from her character onto mine. But there are some things that I wish hadn't rubbed off onto me. I find myself saying things like tomato and trunk and basil. Now, I see people laughing, right? This, it, it, is, it, it is comical, but, but the point nevertheless stands. You see, I don't want to say tomato. Gabrielle takes great joy in hearing me say this accidentally. Right? I don't want to say it. In fact, I want to not say it. It's directly against my conscious will. But spending time with her has somehow affected my brain and it's changing, modifying my behavior against my consent and directly against my conscious will. Our brains are easy to manipulate. So the question is, how big is your brain? The average human brain is about 1,260 cubic centimeters. The average ostrich brain is about 43 times smaller at around 29 cubic centimeters. Nevertheless, when presented with information such as this, when presented with danger, when presented with things that can cause not the, only the loss of life, but the loss of eternal life, we tend to do this. And we do it in mass 
and we even joke. Interesting quote that I read said, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Right? Don't want to hear it, Maris. We're in a battle between good and evil, and as many of us are becoming more and more aware, there is not much to go in this battle. The story goes that there was a young boy who went and spoke to his grandfather. And his grandfather started telling him a story, and he said that inside each one of us, there are two wolves that are fighting for control. One wolf is a good wolf. He represents things like love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And there is another wolf that represents all the evil characteristics. And they are constantly fighting for control. And the little boy is entranced and he, he looks at the grandfather and he asks him, if, if this battle is, is raging on all the time, how do we know which one will win? Which one will win, Papa? And he looks at him and he says, the one that you feed more. So I want to leave you with a question. Which one are you feeding? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you want us to draw near to you, Lord. Father, we invite you into our hearts and we ask you, Lord, to help us be mindful of the things that we are allowing ourselves to behold, Lord. We want to behold you, Lord. We want to be those who, when we see your face, we say, this is our God. We have awaited him. Lord, we look forward to the day we return. We pray these things in Jesus' name.